Back in 2008, Steve Jobs stunned the computing industry with the release of the MacBook Air, an impossibly thin and light notebook computer. But before the MacBook Air, we had the PowerBook Duo. Now the PowerBook Duo series was released in 1992. This particular model was from 94. But even then it wasn't Apple's first go at making a laptop smaller. So this here is the PowerBook 100. And this was a shrunk down version of their Macintosh portable, which was enormous. Now they needed Sony's help, of course, to shrink down that rather large computer into something so small and compact. And Sony at the time, and probably still now, are masters at miniaturization with their all of their devices and Walkmans, what have you. So Sony was able to shrink down the Macintosh portable into something which is, by all intents and purposes, pretty similar size to the Duo. Uh, this came out years later. Now obviously the Duo is more powerful, but it just goes to show how advanced the 100 was for its time. And even now I think it's quite a good looking and well built computer. But anyway, this video is not about the 100, so we'll pop that away and talk about the Duo. So this particular duo, like I mentioned, is from 94. This is the 280C, which is the fastest and most powerful version before they moved into PowerPC, has the color screen. The other thing with these machines, they can be upgraded to a whopping 40 megabytes of memory. Uh, they take a SCSI hard drive and of course, all of the usual early 90s Apple quirks. Now, in an effort to get this as small and light as possible, Apple actually did away with all of the useful ports on these laptops. Now, just like the 100, it's got no floppy drive. However, the 100 does have an array of useful ports on the back, whereas this has a processor direct slot here, proprietary to Apple, uh, that only can connect to various docks, which we'll talk about in a minute. Also on the back, we have a power button. We have the power input here and underneath these little flip down feet, we have a serial, one serial connection, and this one has the optional modem installed as well, but normally you just have a blank off plate there. So all in all, pretty limited in regards to the ports on these machines, but that was the price that you had to pay back then to have a small and light, super portable, but powerful laptop. Now the must have accessory, if you wanted your Duo to be at all useful, was of course a dock. This is called the Duo Mini Dock, and this is their sort of medium sized offering. And it just clicks onto the back of the computer, locks in with this handle here. You slide the handle down, it locks it on, and then you could actually just leave it connected all the time if you want, but it sort of ruins the whole thin and light aesthetic of this computer. Now, the dock provided you with all of those necessary ports that you needed on this computer, so it was kind of like a compulsory sort of thing to have with you at all times if you needed access to those ports. So starting from this end, we have our power button. Now obviously the dock covers the existing ports on the machine and buttons, so we need a power button to turn the machine on. We need a power adapter that passes through the power and powers the dock as well. We have a port for the floppy drive, external floppy drive we can connect, which again, if you're using this machine in the day, you'd have to have a floppy drive with you because it doesn't have one built into the machine and floppy drives were still very much in use at the time. We have our ADB connector for mouse and keyboards. We have a Apple monitor out for an external monitor. We have a couple of serial ports here. We have a SCSI port here for any external hard drives or peripherals. We have our audio out, our audio in. We have a Kensington lock here, and we have our pass-through for the modem as well. Like I mentioned earlier, there was a range of docks developed for the PowerBook Duo. There was even some third-party docks developed as well. So the mini dock we've had a look at, there was also a micro dock, which I don't have, I can't show you, but maybe I'll flash up a picture of it here. And that was obviously a much smaller dock that just gave you the essentials that you needed while out and about. But the other dock I want to show you today is the Duo dock, which is here. And that most certainly is not portable. 
So obviously not a portable unit. There's a power supply in here and a whole bunch of stuff we'll talk about in a second. But the idea behind this duo dock is that it would sit in your office or perhaps at home, wherever your base of operations were. And then when you were there, you would take your PowerBook Duo and you would plug it in. That's right, the entire computer would plug into the dock. I'll show you that in a second. And once the computer plugs into the dock, it expands the capabilities of your computer and turns it pretty much into a desktop machine. As well as providing all of the same ports that the mini dock has, it also has networking installed in here. The duo dock has a floppy drive built in. It has space for two new bus cards. It has more video RAM so you can run high resolution monitors. And it has a place for a SCSI hard drive as well. So you can have a separate hard drive in this unit, which you access once the computer plugs into it. And the PowerBook Duo just goes right in the front of the Duo dock. Oh, that reminds me. Let's talk about PCBWay. When it comes to doing your next project, you can either do it the wrong way or the PCB way. That's right, PCBWay has everything you need to create your next project. So much more than just PCBs, they also do sheet metal fabrication, 3D printing, metal printing, CNC machining, you name it, they can do it. Everything you need for your next project can be found at PCB Way. So if you need to know which way to go with your next project, it's PCB Way. Kind sponsor of today's video. So the design idea behind this is really to take what is a thin and light computer, you plug it in here and it turns it into a desktop powerhouse. Now the issue for these PowerBooks is that they have some capacitors which tend to leak and they cause damage such that when you turn them on, it can fry unobtainable chips in the machine, rendering them dead forever. So we don't want that to happen, so I've only turned this on a handful of times, and what we're gonna do is pull it apart and swap out those capacitors for brand new tantalum polymer capacitors that will never leak. You can see here, there's sort of some signs of corrosion, something's in that slot there. Now this is the battery. If we push this button, we can slide that to the side and pull the battery out. Uh, this battery looks okay, but if we have a look inside here, there's some sort of just beginnings of corrosion down on those terminals. You can't quite see on the camera, but I can see it when I use my eyeball in there. Now the other problem that these duos have is they have these rubber feet here. Uh, which go sticky. These have done that exact thing. The other place they have rubber feet is here on the lid and they go sticky as well. And what actually happens is it sticks the lid down to the body. You can see here where we've got remnant of that sticky rubber. So if you leave it too long, it makes it really, actually really quite hard to open the lid because it glues itself down. Taking this laptop apart is pretty straightforward. It's just a matter of removing a few screws on the back. With the screws undone on the back, the keyboard then just lifts out. And of course, there's a few ribbon cables to sort out before we can lift it away. Next, we can slide the screen hinge covers off and they attach quite nicely. They slide instead of snapping on like some of the earlier models. And then all of the plastic parts sort of clip apart, provided you know which way to slide them and which way they go. Uh, in fact, it's quite a nicely put together machine, much better than their 100 series laptops. To get down to the capacitors we need, they're actually down here, underneath this magnesium heat spreader and strengthening. So before we move on, I can actually have a look around and start to see corrosion forming on the magnesium frame. So we got in here not a moment too late. So the display ribbon cable is connected to the motherboard, so we have to undo that first and the hinges are connected with just one screw on each hinge. And here we have the internal SCSI hard drive. It's an IBM model, 320 megabyte from 1994. Now with all of that out of the way, it's just a few more screws to remove the magnesium frame. And that was also the only thing holding in our motherboard. And there we have the core of the computer. Looking closely at the board, I can see some blue corrosion on the battery terminal, and there's a few other suspect places where some of that corrosion from the magnesium frame has started making its way onto the board. Looking around the area of these capacitors that we're going to remove, I can see signs already of some leakage and corrosion here. So again, it's good timing we're getting in here and rectifying this issue right now. And sure enough, while removing these caps, I can smell that telltale fishy smell of leaky cap juice. And with that, all of the capacitors are removed. 
and I can't see any traces eaten away, but we'll give this area a clean up and have a thorough inspection before we put the new caps on. With the area now clean, I can give it a good look and just see where the corrosion might have been. I can see a little bit on that one pad that we indicated before, but with a quick application of the fiberglass pen, I'll clean that up and have it ready to go for the new caps. The last thing to do in this area is just to apply some fresh solder and get it all ready for those new caps. So the new capacitors have arrived and they're ready to solder on to the motherboard. I have to make sure I do them in the right order so I don't get myself stuck and block off access to the next one. All the caps are soldered on there so it should be ready to roll. Uh, there's a few other modifications though I want to do before we put this back together. Let me explain. This is the original hard drive that came with the PowerBook. It's a 320 megabyte SCSI drive. It still works, it's from 94, so who knows how much longer it's gonna work for. So I'm going to replace it with a solid state drive. This is a SCSI to SD, and it is designed for PowerBooks. It's the PowerBook edition. It's gonna fit in where the hard drive was. We are just going to probably have to make a few modifications to transfer this mounting bracket over to this flat PCB. This is an old 40 megabyte SCSI hard drive, which I've kept from a older machine. It doesn't work anymore, but I thought I'd keep it because it might come in handy. I need these sort of brackets here where it's a screw on each side. So I'm gonna disassemble this and see if I can just use this uh, chassis. And with everything removed, we now have just a aluminum frame, which we're going to use for these screw points here. So these are the 90 degree fastening brackets I need to make this work. So the old hard drive brackets have been transferred over to the SCSI 2SD. So it's out with the old drive and in with the new solid state storage solution. Great. With our hard drive replaced with solid state storage, it's just about time to put everything back together. I'm gonna to replace this eight megabytes of RAM with this stick here, which is 36 megabytes. And combined with the four megabytes on board, that gives us the maximum 40 megabytes that this machine can handle. The other thing I'm going to replace is I'm going to get rid of the modem. Now this card is the modem plus the power switch combined. So I'm going to swap that out with a card that just has the power switch on it, which leaves us all of this empty space here for reasons I'm going to show you next. So with the motherboard back into the case, we can see our big vacant area here. Now what I'm trying to do is fix the issue with our SCSI to SD takes a micro SD card. That goes in here and it's going to be really annoying every time I want to change that micro SD card I'm going to have to remove uh, just disassemble the whole machine to get that card out so what I'm planning on doing is using this which is an SD card sort of extender so this section here will go into the SCSI to SD and this end here is just going to extend that port wherever I want to put it because I want to put this port where the old modem port was so that I'll be able to just access that SD card slot through the modem port and that should work nicely. So with everything put back together it chimes and boots to a flashing disk icon because it can't find a startup disk. With our new SCSI to SD slot at the back I can just pop a card in and then we can boot into an install disk and install to that hard drive. So we've got our hard drive sorted out, but we need to get an operating system on here and I'm gonna use the blue SCSI for that. So that means we're gonna to connect to our mini dock just by sliding it back in and then pushing the handle down and that locks it together into the dock. Now on the back of the dock, we've got our SCSI port and we've got our blue SCSI here with an adapter. So we're just gonna pop that straight in. Now let's power it up and install an OS. Okay, you can see on the side here, we've got the legacy recovery, which is the image that's on the blue SCSI. And it's seeing our little SCSI to SD hard drive here, which I've named Mac Volume. So let's go into the recovery disk and we'll just install the correct software for this machine. With the OS installed to the internal hard drive, I removed the dock and the blue SCSI and just booted straight into the internal hard drive. If we just have a look at about this Macintosh, we can see that it is indeed running system software 7.5.3 and we're seeing all 40 megabytes of that extra RAM. Great, this job's done. The next thing we have to do is get some games on this machine and for that we're going to use the Duo Dock. So before we put the monitor on the Duo Dock, let's just have a look inside. So if we see here, we've got the 
motor mechanism and that controls the injection and ejection of the PowerBook Duo. We've got some extra video RAM here on this motherboard. We've got a little software modem down here. Um, here we've got a 50 pin SCSI port or a SCSI plug for a hard drive. Um, I can't quite work out where you'd put the hard drive. I imagine maybe over here somewhere and then it must have a cable that goes over to this plug. And underneath this is a couple of new bus cards and that, um, that's like a riser that goes down to the lower section where those cards would go. So the idea with this PowerBook is you can be relaxing at home, maybe playing some games or doing those spreadsheets you promised your boss you would have ready for the next day. And of course, when it's time to go, you just take the whole PowerBook with you. And when you get to the office, you plug it in and you're good to go from where you left off. And there we have it, we've booted to desktop. Now, this machine is actually also networked, so I've got it connected to my uh, Apple Share network, which I've set up here in the basement. Hit Apple Share, there it is, straight away. Retro Net. Okay, let's join it. I've copied a few games over from the network. Let's try them out. Let's have a look at SimCity. Okay, well, I'm about to run out of money and no one's moved into my city, so. That was fun. So with the PowerBook Duo connected into the Duo Dock, we've obviously got a much bigger screen. We've got a proper keyboard and mouse. So you can really use this as a dual purpose machine. You can have it at the office and you've got your spreadsheets and whatever on your nice big screen. And then when it comes time to go home, you just hit the eject button and it's gonna shut down and spit the machine out just like that and away I go, off home to play my games. Well, that's been a really good result today. It's the perfect duo, the PowerBook and the dock, the big dock and the little tiny dock. So each has its purpose. Of course, you can go dockless if you wanna be super mobile when you're out and about and on the go. And when you get back to the office, you can plug it in and get all the extra power that the duo dock has. Or you, maybe you have this one at home where you can hook up a floppy drive or a, another SCSI device or something like that. So it doesn't matter if you're at home or in the office, but today you've been in the basement. Have a great day. Okay, we can't get past the copy protection. Never mind. <laughs>